Kelly Erfer, I'm River Steward along with Ron Rhodes from Connecticut River Conservancy and we're doing a little update on the dam relicensing and, and as an organization we do policy work, we work in community, we do education, we work with property owners on restoration projects, we do it all, all kinds of different things. So the Connecticut River watershed, you know, you guys know probably more than half of the watershed is actually in Vermont and New Hampshire, a little tiny bit in Canada. Um, and one, a big focus of our work ends up being around dams because it is one of the major impacts to the river system. Uh, and you can see here, you know, by dams, we're talking like small, um, you know, dams used for uh, fire control a hundred years ago, hydroelectric dams, like, you know, all your different kinds of dams. So in um, you know, in our work, I end up focusing on the hydroelectric dams and the regulation and relicensing of those dams. Ron gets the satisfying job <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> taking unused dams out, things like that, and allowing for fish passage. So uh, on the main stem of the river, there are 10 functioning hydroelectric dams, three water storage dams, and then three breach dams which is, you know, you could, they're certainly not working, so we're trying to figure out how to get those big piles of concrete out of the river as well, because they're hazards. But um, all of the dams that are in New Hampshire and Vermont are essentially either kind of owned or controlled by one company, now called Great River Hydro, used to be TransCanada, and they took the Connecticut River dams and the Deerfield River dams and put, separated them into a, sold them to an LLC that's owned by a company called Arclight, which is an investment company out of Boston. So um, they're privately held and they're expected to make money in addition to generating electricity, which we need. Um, so FERC, not a curse word. Uh, the <laughs> stands for Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So our hydroelectric dams are regulated by FERC as our other energy infrastructure. Um, and they receive a license that generally lasts from about 30 to 50 years. The license is that long because initially that was the amount of time you needed to get a return on investment for building a facility. For relicensing, it's a little absurd that the license would be that long, but that's where we're at. So uh, the last time that the dams that are being relicensed right now, uh, the last time we went through this process was 1979. As you can imagine, you kind of go through the advocacy work one time, and then you literally have almost a generational change before you get to do it again. So this relicensing process started in 2012. Um, it has, it, right now, FERC is working with these five different facilities in one kind of collective process. These three, Wilder, Bellows Falls, and Vernon, which I um, know all you guys are familiar with, um, are owned by Great River Hydro in Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, the Northville Mountain Pump Storage Facility and Turner's Falls Dam are owned by a different company, First Light, in uh, Massachusetts, just when you get across the border. But the idea is that they're working on these together because as an ecosystem moves through it, you kind of want to try to coordinate efforts. And so there they are on the map, Wilder, Bellows, Vernon. The pump station is right in here, kind of pretty close to, to Turner's Falls Dam. So um, the process started in 2012. This is a painful. I, I put this slide in here just because I want you to understand how, how painful this aspect of my job can be. <laughs> this is the full kind of regulatory process. Started in 2012. We are just about here. Not quite at the beginning of this. Um, and so uh, over since 2012 there have been multiple public meetings to identify which studies should be done in the project areas. Uh, and um, we've commented on those studies, commented on an initial application, and then what we're expecting is in uh, the first quarter of this year, sometime by April, we're going to get a revised final application submitted by the company. And we will have another opportunity to comment, and this is sort of bringing us closer to the end of the process. 
And of the 33 studies done, uh, you know, what ends up happening with many of these is in, on that federal level with relicensing, there are other federal laws that bring other stakeholders into the process. So many of the fisheries studies or certainly any studies that involve endangered species have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and or NOAA and or the state fisheries biologists focused on those studies and also providing comment. Um, you have the states like for water quality or habitat, the states are also involved in that. You may have, there's a cultural and historic resources study, so in that case, case you have the state historic preservation offices involved. What sort of, you know, as our organization tries to hold this whole thing, because we are holistically working on the river, some things get this additional help from the other entities that we partner with, some things do not. And so um, the erosion issue is something that's kind of fallen in our hands as the, the only people that are really focusing on it, maybe that's a slight of an overstatement, but we are focusing on it intensely. Um, and then also issues around recreation is something that we are focusing on. When, in, and many of you know this in the room, but basically the way the dams operate at the moment, they hold the water back and then around four o'clock in the afternoon they start to pass the water through. When that occurs, the area behind the dams will drop, the surface water elevation will drop as they're generating electricity. And then around 10 o'clock at night, they stop generating, and then the surface water comes up again, which means at least once a day, that surface water elevation is fluctuating about two feet, which is not a natural process for a river. Um, and so this has been going on, you know, for 70, 80, 90, 100 years. I mean, I think they've changed the operation some over those decades, but, you know, it's, it's that action is essentially kind of hammering the riverbanks, and this is where this loss of land is coming from. And the area that is sort of in the Putney area uh, is not as affected by surface water elevations as the areas right above the dam. So each dam, I'll go back, <coughs> each dam you know, the Vernon Dam impoundment is about 22 miles long, right? So it, it, it might be this long and then there's a little rivering section in there that is not having the same kind of erosion occurring that is incurring in the actual impoundment where the, where the water, surface water elevation fluctuates. Same here, Bellows Falls, the impoundment, you know, is also about 26 miles long. My scale might be off. Um, and so there's an area of the river where erosion is really bad, like in Claremont, right? And as you get further upriver, mm -hmm. it decreases. And in fact, you might have things like in the Cornish area, it's the top of the impoundment of the Bellows Falls Dam, um, and it's right below where Wilder's water is coming in. So the water coming in from Wilder is meeting the impoundment, the water slows down and it drops the sediment. So in that area, the, the river is actually quite shallow. So there's changes in the river as you go up based on, um, you know, literally how far you are away from the dam or above the dam. Wilder, the impoundment is 46 miles, so that's the biggest area. Yeah. Are they all coordinated computer-wise to, 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 to discharge at the same time? They are scaled, I believe, through the system. So, you know, at 15 Mile Falls, there's three much larger hydroelectric dams, and then as you get up by the Connecticut Lakes, um, the water is controlled through the whole system. So they are coordinating among all of the facilities the water flow. So my understanding is generally, you know, they start generating and releasing, I may have this backwards, like they may start at Vernon to start to lower the pool so that the water from Bellows can fill it, you we'll know, keep it level. or vice versa. So they're coordinated, mm -hmm. but they're, I don't think they're coordinated just from the perspective of water. It's also, it depends on other things having to do with the electricity market, which ones get called on, when they're generating, if they're choosing not to generate. And or if one maybe discharges more than another. Yeah. yeah. Or if you, and also if you have, 
you know, more and more with climate change, we're having uh, heavier rain events in a more localized area. So you might have a huge uh, rain in the White River that's dumping a lot of water in that area of the river, and then they have to, you know, compensate for that a little bit. So it's actually quite complicated, and most of it, um, I believe, all of it is now, uh, you know, computer generated and. Yeah, so they know they what the weather's going to be and how much rainfall is coming in the next 24 hours or 12 yeah. hours so that they can start to do something about it. Yeah, and they also have to know that because a piece right. of their work is also flood control, so, yeah. I'm pretty familiar with this. I watch it a lot, and it's very complicated. And, it's, and it, I know that if it's a hot day and it's a weekday in the summer, that around 2.30, the water will start to go down because, and the more, the hotter it is in Hartford and Boston, the more air conditioning is used, the, the higher, the price literally goes up and down by the second. It's literally, it's, it goes up and it does, it's, it's not set any time ahead of time. It just goes, it fluctuates. Mm -hmm. They wait until they have to let it go because they get like 10 times the kilowatt hour price if if they can supply it when it's really really needed like they have different levels of and so it, it, at four o'clock in the afternoon on a really hot summer day the river will be just tearing down there I mean, down to the down to the dam but the other thing they do which is kind of interesting is on the weekends they keep the water up and my understanding is that two reasons one is there's not so much Industrial use, like office buildings and so forth, that require that require heightened le le electrical availability, but also because they there's a mandate of some kind for recreational use. So on the weekends, I could always count on there being plenty of water to pump because they keep it right up so people could, you know, do the boating. But it's really um, it's a it's very it's very complicated. Yeah, it is, and and the recreational use. Can is part of the license, so there will be articles in the license that define what the company may need to do to support recreational use. So we've been working on this since 2012. I took over in this position about two and a half years ago, and um, you know I wanted to kind of apprise you of the next things that we are hoping to kind of focus on. Um, so we just a couple in in 2012 a. Several of the towns submitted um, town meeting resolutions that uh, then were submitted to FERC as comments. And I feel like the more comments we can get to FERC about local concerns, the more they will pay attention. If we are not saying anything, they're going to just issue that license, you know, the way they want to. So they really need to hear from the public repeatedly. Um, so. We sent out this town meeting resolution, which has language that kind of explains the problem and then asks for the towns to submit the resolution to FERC essentially as a comment. And I'm partly hoping that uh, if this is engaged at our town meetings this year, that will also provide an opportunity to just educate people and talk about it. Now, there's one of me, so I can't come to all the town meetings, so you know, I've sent this to all the select boards. Um, and conservation commissions and so this may come up at your town meeting and if you are able and willing to talk about it or talk for it you know I would really appreciate that I have copies of it here as well um, in conjunction with that we've also had some meetings with staff from both the Vermont and New Hampshire congressional delegation uh, with the hope that they will collectively send a letter to FERC as comments to make sure that FERC is aware of local concerns about erosion and, you know, property owners' concerns about the loss of their land. So I've been, we are hopeful that that'll happen in the next couple of months, but that might also be something that you could do if you're engaging on any level with the staff from any of, uh, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, just reiterate to them, you know, if you happen to be a farmer who's lost land and you can tell them that story, that will help move that process along as well. Yeah. Notice in the video earlier that um, a lot of the New Hampshire side looked like it was very well buffered with the uh, trees and 15 foot or whatever. No, it's it, on. It, no. it depends yeah. on whose fields you're on. Yeah. So oh. if, if, the, if it's buffered like that um, and well buffered, I guess, is that 
preventing erosion 100%? No. No. Okay. No. no. And you can, I mean, Steve did a, actually a, a stream bank stabilization project many years ago that's completely been taken out. So okay. we will help you know, landowners install the buffers. It may slow it down, yeah, but in easy. these cases, a lot of the erosion, it's because the toe is getting undercut yeah. from the water going yeah. in yeah. and yeah. coming out and saturating it every day, and then the top topples in. Because right? it's and water it's like going up into the, into the ground and then slowly coming out. You don't even see it, but it's, yeah. it's happening. Yeah. Piping. Yeah. yeah. Piping. Kathy, That's if I could just add to Billy's question. So when we're doing our buffer plantings, they're most effective at reducing the rate of erosion when your banks are, let's say, six feet tall or eight feet tall, right? If you have a hundred foot tall bank on the Connecticut River, yeah. planting trees isn't going to do squat because the erosion is down at the water level. So most of our buffer plantings, we do do some on the main stem, but you know those roots only go down so far, and that erosion, as Kathy said, is, is the undercutting. It's yes. down at the toe of the bank. So, you know, bigger projects on the Main Stem River, you know, NRCS has done lots of different attempts over the years to try to reduce that erosion, and even those major projects haven't. Right, right. Um, you know, in the studies, the company did two studies on erosion, and they were very careful to structure those studies in a way where they actually did not look at the saturation from the pool level elevations. What they did was structure the study in a way to uh, look at velocity, which is how a natural river system would erode. So they basically proved that, you know, rivers erode because of velocity along the bank. It's not the situation we have here. So. If you have a natural run of river, it won't, won't pipe. It won't pipe or That's won't another pipe. angle. So I'm trying to work at this from several different angles. So this Dartmouth and Synapse battery study, um, one of the things that might help would be to actually have the hydroelectric facilities move to run of river, meaning that instead of holding that water back and having that fluctuation every day, they essentially are generating electricity all the time. And so they're just moving the water through the system like you would have in a natural river. Our estimates are that they would essentially be generating the same amount, almost the same amount of electricity over the course of a day. It's just they're going to be making less money because they'd be generating in the morning when the electricity rates are not as high. Another complication is that about a quarter or a third of the revenue actually comes from the capacity market for these facilities. And what that means is that you know, hydro facilities are unique in that if like the entire grid went down and there was a blackout and they have water stored behind the dam, they can start generating and that facility can actually start the grid where like a nuclear facility or a coal facility needs electricity to start it. These facilities can, you know, it's called black start. They can start the grid. So Depending it's, on what the blackout's caused by it. Right, course, yeah. right. Um, so because of that ability, they are able to bid into this capacity market and they get paid even if they're not generating and even if they're not being called on to do that, you know, millions of dollars over the many uh, facilities. So if, you, if they are forced to go run of river where they're moving that water through, um, it may mean that they are losing access to that capacity market. So one of the things we have done as an organization is try to get some analysis done on if they actually added battery storage to the facility somewhere or the other, whether they could retain that uh, access to the capacity market and that revenue by instead of using the water as the battery, actually use batteries as batteries. So we have a... Um, Synapse Ecological Economics is doing a small project for us. We're going to talk to the company about that, and we will also submit that to FERC as a suggestion. Um, and from the habitat perspective, uh, you know, our hope is that this both states will require or encourage through the 401 certificate process that the that the hydro facilities move to run. They're already doing that in a sense with Tesla batteries, wall hung batteries in yep. people's homes. I mean you're you're seeing more and more and more people. It makes all the sense in the world. You you get to use it 
guaranteed if there's an outage they can't steal from you or take it from you and pay you pay back but it, it, if they need it they can draw draw your personal battery down on your wall depending on how many you have on your wall and whatever they can draw it down to 20 percent or something like that so that at least there's a little bit left there for you in case something goes down in the meantime they're borrowing back which is your battery idea yeah which yeah you know, same thing be. it's just that everybody had the batteries are everywhere yep Right. And that might be an option for the hydro company as well to like yeah. do a third party contract or something. Right. So so we're working on that. Um, and then one of the other things that came up, we've also been talking to property owners about their flowage uh, rights. So, so many of the properties had flowage rights sold to the company in the 1940s. And one of the questions is, uh, you know, when that occurred, the property only or the farmer probably thought like, yeah, okay, you can flood my land and you're going to destroy the trees and stuff on it and that's fine. But we're not actually clear that those farmers were agreeing to have their land completely eroded. And so there's many situations where, you know, property owners are having to go and <laughs> reduce the size of their lot so they're not paying taxes on the property that's not there anymore because it is now in the Long Island Sound. So, um... <laughs> We've been trying to find if there's a legal mechanism for the property rights with the flowage easements. It's not looking very good because the Federal Power Act seems to preempt those individual property rights. Um, so one of the other things we're, we're considering is trying to understand or map the impoundment in what was included in the license. So this little map here is from the 1979 license. And it defines the impoundment at, this is for Wilder, at 385 feet. And so I'm trying to get a class or someone to be able to take this and actually take an ortho photo of the impoundment now and be able to see if we can quantify the change in the shape of the impoundment and the loss of land. Um, and whether there may be a legal angle there, I don't know. Or at the very least, it helps to you know, really clearly show people what's happened since 1980. And then when this final revised application is submitted, somewhere around April, we will be commenting on it. We'll be encouraging all the towns to commenting on it. We'll be encouraging you all to comment on it. Um, again, because you know, it's a bit of a sort of classic David and Goliath situation. You know, we have a somewhat anonymous federal agency that's making the decision here. And if they do not hear from the local communities, uh, they have nothing to consider or respond to. And their inclination, as um, you know, an energy regulatory commission, is to make sure these companies get their license and are able to make money. So it, we really actually, they need to hear from us to do anything else. And um, over time, any other questions? So I'm just curious if, if this moves in the direction that you would hope it would. Um, if you as an organization, or we as a group, um, have a good plan on what we would suggest that we would want. We can, I, I think that's important too. Yeah, so in the resolution language, you know, we essentially, and this is from talking to a bunch of stakeholders over several years, right? What we've heard is, you know, ongoing monitoring of the stream bank, like real monitoring, LIDAR data, you know, <coughs> being able to calculate how much land is being lost, when it's being lost, um, a, an adaptive management program for the shoreline, so essentially being able to track that and then respond to it. Money to either compensate landowners or help pay landowners to do stream bank stabilization projects or by conservation easements or by land outright. Um, and I think there's one more thing, but I can't remember what it is right now. So essentially really having the company pay attention to the erosion along the river and then be held accountable for it one way or another. My hope is that we can move to run of river because it would be better for the river for you know, many different reasons, including habitat and endangered species and all of those things. And I think without having that fluctuation, we would see a change in the, in the banks. But um, you know, short of that, or in addition to that, more likely it would be great to kind of have this suite. And for the Northfield Mountain Pump Station in uh, Massachusetts, there is a precedent for this. You know, that pump station <laughs> raises and lowers the water level something like five feet a day at a velocity that is, 
you know, a 50 to 100 year storm pretty intensely. And so those communities there um, have forced FERC to set up a process to monitor the banks there. And so at the very least, we want something like that done for, for our area of the river up here. Okay, Paul's got the hook. So. Um, <laughs> Hi, this is Tom Beaudry. I'd like to take you for a ride up along the Connecticut River. We're going to start out just south of the Great Meadows in Putney, Vermont. I want you to pay attention to the river banks, um, especially the mature trees that are there in the riparian areas on both sides of the river. This is a close-up <coughs> of the bank off from the Great Meadows in Putney. Notice how natural the banks are with a good slope and trees coming right down to the river's edge. We're still moving north on the river. Uh, Vermont's on our left. Again, notice the good riparian areas and the trees. We're almost up to Bellows Falls. Here we are coming up on Bellows Falls. Below us is the hydroelectric dam um, and the canal that feeds the hydroelectric plant. The dam itself is actually in the center of the picture underneath the railroad trestle. This is a field in New Hampshire 40 years ago. It was a 10 acre hay field. Now it's about three and a half acres. We're continuing north, we're above the dam. Notice <clears throat> the field borders. This is actually brush that's 10 or 15 feet high. And as we move along, it kind of disappears. As you can see, this is on the Vermont side. We're still heading north. There are no trees. And notice this bank. This is the sewer treatment plant in Charlestown. Looking down the riverbank, you can see how the river cuts in. The only thing keeping the sewer treatment plant there is the riprap that the Army Corps engineers did. Now we're up almost <clears throat> to the Escutney Windsor Bridge. We're actually headed south looking on the New Hampshire side. I want you to pay attention to what this riverbank looks like. There are no trees. In a minute, we'll have a close-up. So as you can see, this is pretty much a straight drive. The green that you see here is actually from topsoil that has worked down over the edge. That's what the grass is growing on. This bank continues to erode. The major cause of the erosion is the raising and lowering of the water level from the dams, which is done um, sometimes multiple times in a dam in a day. The other thing of, to note is that the soil type in this field is basically the same soil type as down in the Great Meadows in Putney, which you saw the natural uh, banks. I would like to note that this was taken around the Bellows Falls Dam with situations above and below the Wilder Dam are very similar to the Bellows Falls Dam and you almost think you're on two different 